So guys, it finally happened. I was writing some code. My son asked me, hey dad, where does memory come from? And I realized I didn't have a good answer for him. So in this video, we're gonna go over how does a program get more memory at runtime, right? So to talk about that, we first have to talk about where does the program get memory from? Where can, can memory come from in the first place? So we have two regions of memory that are broken up into what's called kernel space and user space. Memory not drawn to scale, but basically the region is cut in half, where the entire region below hex 7f, fffff, that whole big line there, and down is user space that we can actually map into our program for a process to use during execution. That all lives right here. So when we run a program and we load it, what actually happens is the elf is taken apart into a few parts. Towards the bottom, near zero here, we have three sections that get loaded up. The first is called the text section, and that's where your code actually lives. Your program gets loaded pretty close to zero, not exactly, but depending on ASLR, it's around zero. Above that, we have the data section. That is constants or variables that are defined at compile time that will not change or can be used as data, uh, and they live in this area on, you know, in the memory. And then above that, we have the BSS section. Those are uninitialized variables that get loaded into the memory at runtime. And then way above that, at the top of user space or the very, very end, we have the stack structure, and the stack structure is one that grows downward, right? So the downward growing means that as the stack gets bigger, its top gets more and more negative. So the question is then, okay, if we don't have data in the elf that gets loaded in, we don't have data that gets put onto the stack, which is already done at compile time, where does data come from? Uh, the answer to this question is that there are three locations we can get memory from. The first is going to be a user space allocator, like the glibc malloc, for example. The second is the system break and break system calls. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then third is the mmap system call. So first we're gonna talk about the user space allocator that creates what's called a heap. So a heap is a dynamically allocated structure that grows upwards towards the stack while the stack is growing downwards towards the heap. We are going to go into our VM here and I'll show you guys actually how to use the heap and talk about the pros and cons. So by calling malloc, what you're doing is you're telling glibc, hey, I wanna use your allocator and I want you to give me 10, 24 bytes, right? Really, really easy to use. So you pretty much say, give me this many bytes. And then if we get that value back, we can use it and put stuff there. So, you know, we alloc 10, 24 bytes. And then if we get it, I stir copy this value into my heap, run it out. And then we have to free it to give it back to the allocator. So not really that complicated. I would say this allocator is the easiest to use. The trade-off here is that the allocator in the back end, as you use it more and more, is actually a very complicated linked list structure. So the trade-off here for simplicity in just asking for this many bytes is that it's a little more performance intensive, right? So if you're looking for very, very performant, you know, if you're constrained by how fast program has to work, maybe sometimes the glibc allocator is not for you. So if you don't use a glibc allocator, then what is the next step, right? So second, we have the system break or break system calls. This arrow here points to the fact that the BSS section is the top of the ELF, and that denotes the system break or what the system defines as the top of your user space outside of the stack. By using the system break system call, we can actually increase that break value to create more room for us to put variables, right? So I'll show you guys how to use that here, pretty straightforward. So using this program, we call system break two times, and I'll man, or not system break, set break rather. Um, the s break function takes the increment value to tell the kernel how many bytes to increment the system break by. By saying s break zero, we actually don't increment the program break at all. We just say, you know, give me the program break and we print it out here. Then we can increment the program break by a certain value. In this case, we do 4096 bytes, we print it out. And then just to prove that we can actually now use that newly allocated space um, we, yeah, uh, so first it was this value, now it's this value. We turn the difference between these two values, so first n, which is now this many bytes longer, into an array, put some data there, and we print it out, right? So I'll show you guys that. There you go. So first we had the system break that was set here, and then the system break got moved up to this value. You know, so we went from 6,000 to 7,000 in hex, and we're able to use that space to put these two, three, and four values there. So the trade-offs here are, this is actually the most performant allocator that you have access to in the user space, right? It's way more performant than the glibc allocator, but it's not, and it's, it is more performant rather, 
than the mmap function I'll talk to you about next. The problem is you don't have a lot of granularity here. Basically, all you can do is slide that system break up a number of bytes, and then you have to actually internally manage what memory you use, right? So trade-offs. And then finally, we have the mmap system call. The mmap system call literally says, hey there, kernel, literally give me any memory you have access to. It will appear wherever the kernel decides to put it, and that's why I kind of put the square in the middle here. You know, it doesn't have to appear anywhere. It can appear wherever you, you know, the kernel decides to give it to you. You can make suggestions as to where you want to see it, but you're not guaranteed to get it back there. So we'll go back and I'll walk through a mmap example real quick. So here I use the function mmap, a couple parameters here. This null parameter means that I don't care where it comes from, just give me some number of bytes. I want this many bytes. I want them to come back as read write protected. So previously I wasn't able to control the permissions of the memory that I got back, but I can make this you know, read only memory. I can make this executable memory to put code into. I could do a whole bunch of cool stuff. Um, here I do a copy on write protection and I make it anonymous, which means that it comes back only to my process and it's not mapped into a different file. Um, this is the file descriptor that I could map a file to to show up in memory as opposed to just raw empty memory. Um, and then this is some other flag that we're not gonna worry about. So if I don't get memory back, this will come back as null and I'll say, hey man, I had an error with mmap. I'm not really sure what to do about it. And then we'll print memory here with percent %p. Um, so once I've gotten the new memory to come back, I can then again use it as an array and go from there, right? So I print the data onto the screen and we're all happy hunky dory. So we'll go back and I'll show you guys how mmap works. Boom. So basically we ran the mmap function and I got back memory from the kernel at this address, you know, two, three, and four are the addresses that I put into that new chunk of memory. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is a pretty good allocator as well. Same kind of thing. It's a little more complicated to implement than the glibc heap allocator, um, but at the same time, you have more granularity in the kind of memory you get back. The glibc allocator, you can only get readable, writable memory, and then you have to manually mprotect that memory to get it to be executable if you want in that, or like unprotect it from being writable. Whereas this case, every time you make a call, you can tell it exactly what kind of memory you get back. Um, this is a little less performant than sbreak, but significantly more performant than the glibc malloc allocator. The difference being that the allocator is much friendlier to use than all of these command line arguments. And obviously, just like when you have to free memory from the uh, glibc allocator m on map, you have to unmap the memory from the kernel as well before you leave the program. We'll GCC that real quick. Oh, and the length. We have to specify the length to this function as well. Cool, so then at the end, we just clean ourselves up by making sure that the memory was given back to the kernel uh, in a proper way. So yeah, I mean, that is basically the three major ways that you can get more memory into your process while you're doing things dynamically. I would suggest always use the glibc allocator. I just think it's fun to have access to the mmap functionality where you can kind of ask for bigger chunks, you know, and, you know, have more granularity on their properties. And then also just, you know, a little more for fun too. If you want really quick, need it right now, don't care about the allocator access to memory, um, using the S break functionality or the break functionality uh, that the kernel offers you is pretty powerful as well. So guys, I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video or you learned something, do me a favor, hit like, hit subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.